So this one's titled, The Intermittent Fasting Trend May Pose a Risk to Your Heart. So pretty big title there. The Washington Post, and it's by Anahad O'Connor. And um, I was not quoted in this article, right? You weren't? No, unfortunately not. No, no, it's fine. <laughs> this one caught a lot of heat, so maybe it's good that you weren't <laughs> quoted in it. So I'll, I'll read my summary for you, then we kind of hop into okay. it. So a study presented at the American Heart Association meeting suggested that adhering to an eight-hour eating window, so doing a bit of fasting, may increase the risk of dying from heart disease by 91%, so a big number, uh, compared to a traditional dietary pattern. Uh, even among those with chronic diseases or cancer, while the study highlights a correlation between time-restricted eating and increased mortality, it cannot establish causation, of course. And uh, some critics argue that intermittent fasting may overlook diet quality and long-term health impacts. So pretty good summary of what you read as well. Yeah, the only thing I might um, uh, expand on is the, the terminology. And again, this is where I think intermittent fasting gets used differently by different people. And even in, in your description, you called it intermittent fasting once and I think time-restricted eating once. So mm -hmm. just for the purposes of clarity, I'm going to define uh, this is time-restricted eating. So eating in a limited window in every 24-hour period is time-restricted eating. Intermittent fasting, I define as not eating for at least 24 hours and doing that periodically, right? So okay. I just think it's important because those are those are potentially two very different nutritional interventions. Um, and so it's worth being clear what we're talking about. So I think this study only looked at time-restricted eating and it, did, it was a window yeah. of eight hours. That was less? the smallest window. Yeah. Okay. All right. So I'll go over some of the details of the study. So the study included approximately 20,000 adults in the U.S. with an average age of uh, 49 years old. Uh, 30 participants were followed for a median length of eight years and a maximum length of 17 years. And the study included data from um, NHANES participants who were at least 20 years of old at enrollment. At enrollment uh, and it started between 2003 and ended in 2008. So kind of before the fasting trend, in my yeah. opinion, took off. Right. Uh, and they completed two 24-hour dietary recall questionnaires within the first year of enrollment. Right. So these are presumably mostly people who were doing time-restricted eating, not for health, potential health benefits, but because for one reason or a number, that's the paradigm that they had adopted. Oh, correct. Yeah, exactly. All right, so we'll go over a bit, few more numbers. So people in the eight hour, less than eight hour a day group, there's 414 of them. People in the 12 to 16 hour a day group, there's 11,831. So quite a bit more people. Yeah, this is like the last study, although this is even more skewed in terms of a very small number being in one group and a much larger number being in the other group. Exactly, yeah. And for a total of around 20,000 people and when you add in the third group as well. Uh, so... So a couple interesting facts I found. 20% of the less than eight hour group they smoked were 16.9% of the 12 to 16 hour group smoked. So there's quite a bit, there's a lot more smokers in the less than eight hour group, which I yep. found interesting. Uh, we can go over, we can go into that in more details in a bit. And also they had the highest BMI. So the less than eight hours a day eating group had a 29.9 BMI, which is 0.1 away from obese. Here's a tweet that you posted. Do you want to read uh -oh. it? Want to read your tweet? Want me to read it? You go ahead to read it. All right. In your voice? Yeah. You, you, so, you got to use my accent. All the influences are losing it over the new report that intermittent fasting, hey, you just called it intermittent fasting, <laughs> is associated with a 91% increase in heart disease death. Obviously, many caveats and not published yet, so don't know what the other flaws may exist. That was interesting, too, how they posted this before it was published. That happens sometimes when things get presented at meetings. Okay, it kind of leaks in a way, or? No, no, that, I mean, they, you present it okay. publicly, so mm. people can talk about it, and sometimes articles will get written, sometimes, you know, press releases will be put out based on unpublished data that's only presented at a meeting. That, it happens all the time. Okay, all right, so you continue to say, but this seems like a pretty big effect and probably worth not ignoring completely. Just because we don't want to believe it is true. Actually, so. just because you don't want to believe it. Just because true. you don't want to believe it. I was true. talking about the influencers that were losing it. So honestly, I mean, look, okay, this study has a lot of problems. I would not draw any strong conclusions from this study. I was really trying to poke a bit at the people who, in my view, um, overstate the evidence for benefits from intermittent fasting and time-restricted eating, of which there are many. Mm many of whom have no clue what they're talking about. And so this was really just an effort to say, hey guys, here's some evidence that runs counter to what you're trying to sell. I know you're going to ignore it. I see. And I'm making fun of you. for it. So that was really what this tweet yeah. was about. Because so many people just ignore anything that doesn't fit their worldview. 
Um, and I do think it is worth when you see something like this, it is worth paying attention and 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 doing something like you know what we're doing and actually taking a closer look and asking yourself, you know, is there anything here that is potentially suggestive, or can I just throw it out the window because this is such a poorly designed study that's not even worth talking about? Um, and I do think this is not the first study to suggest that there may be some counterproductive effects associated with intermittent fasting and time restricted eating. Um, and so that was really, that was really why I put that up. Okay. Really so, just to, to yeah, poke the bear yeah, a little bit. Yeah. So I'm not on Twitter, but did you get a lot of retweets, a lot of responses? I don't know. I don't you, 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 so you got to post, post and ghost. <laughs> I mute it. the people who annoy me. Okay. There we go. <laughs> I was just curious if you had a lot of, you know. Probably. I, 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 yeah, I, I honestly don't remember. <laughs> All right, so I've got a few questions for you. So the first one is, um, you know, what were some of the limitations and shortcomings you saw in the study personally? Yeah, I mean, I think, so there, there were, there were quite, a, quite a few that I think limit interpretations. Not necessarily the author's fault. It's the data set that they've got. But, I mean, I think, you know, we already talked about the difference in group sizes. So the, the fact that the uh, eight-hour... Uh, time restricted eating group was so much smaller than the other groups, you know, opens it up to potential biases within that group from a relatively small number of people. So that that's a little bit of a concern. The differences in smoking rate, I think, are telling. And, you know, maybe that's not shocking that people who smoke, especially people who smoke a lot, might eat in a much shorter window. I, I certainly still know some people who smoke and um, smoke a lot, and I think they do tend to actually um, smoke instead of eating. Mm. And then if they're eating the same amount, which this suggests that these people are because their BMI was actually, I think, higher than the other groups or at least comparable. So if you're shrinking how much you're eating in terms of time, but eating as much or more as you would if it was expanded and smoking, it wouldn't be shocking if there were some negative health consequences associated with that. And so I think all of those things suggest that the idea that it's only the window of eating that's driving the negative health consequences, um, uh, that, that's probably an a oversimplification. And, and so I would not from this, if you're using time-restricted eating uh, or, or intermittent fasting to maintain a healthy body weight, um, I wouldn't necessarily change what I was doing based on this. The other piece is we really don't know what the quality of the diet was that these people had. And again, you might speculate that people who are smoking and cramming all their, their food into a short window, but still eat overeating are probably eating a relatively low quality diet, which obviously could also impact health risks. So I think all of those things limit the ability to actually I mean, you should always be careful about drawing causal assumptions from this kind of data, but even more so in this case. Okay. So my, my sort of takeaway, like what I felt reading the study was, you have someone who's for health reasons is trying, okay, I'm, I'm going to eat in this window to reduce my total calories for the day, whatever it is. These people didn't seem like that. They seem to me like people who are maybe working two jobs, kids. Yeah, that's also stress. possible, right? And I don't think I don't think we have any information about that. But yeah, yeah. you could ask yourself, are there other reasons why they were... Uh, reducing the time of the amount of time in each day that they were eating and yeah you could you could speculate all sorts of stuff that could be driving mm -hmm. some of this yeah because they had the you know the 91 percent increase in heart disease so it right. makes you think there's other things going on as well of course but uh so could you walk me through a potential mechanism by which time actually let me add one more thing oh, yeah. so uh i mean i don't remember what the what the other demographics they had on this group is but you do also sometimes see people who are frail and sick don't eat as much and they and they aren't they sleep a lot more so especially very elderly people i don't think this group you know was particularly elderly but you you often see this in the very elderly or people you know maybe even in their 60s who are who are quite um quite unhealthy they sleep a lot and so they're only awake for maybe 10 hours a day right or out mm. of bed and so so they naturally kind of compress the window that they're eating in simply because they're only up and, and active for a shorter window of time. So that may also be something here that could skew their, even if even if only 10% of the people were, when you only have 400 people in your group, True, yeah. you know, that could have a pretty big impact on the outcome. So yeah, I think there's all sorts of reasons that we could come up with for maybe why um, this is, a, is, a, is, is a sort of an artifact of the cohort 
rather than a cause of time-restricted eating. Again, that's all speculation. Could also be that time-restricted eating actually does increase risk of heart disease. Uh, you know, yeah. so I, I wouldn't want to completely rule it out. I would just say this is weak evidence for that. So your frustration is more so people cherry-picking studies to support like what they want, like the support time restricted. Not eating. only cherry picking, but 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 completely misrepresenting the actual data. So the actual data from laboratory studies are very clear. There is, in my view, no compelling evidence that time restricted eating or intermittent fasting, once you control for caloric consumption, have benefits on longevity or health span. At least not large benefits. Mm -hmm. Maybe a teeny tiny benefit. So. You hear people all the time claim that intermittent fasting and time-restricted eating are longevity protocols or longevity interventions. Yeah, that's only if you calorically restrict, and that's only in laboratory animals. Um, and we really don't know that that's not all caloric restriction, and you couldn't get all of those benefits from calorically restricting without doing time-restricted eating or intermittent fasting. So there's just a massive misrepresentation of the actual data, which is which is frustrating to me. That's the problem that I've got. <laughs> and then the human data is very mixed, right? The, the data on time-restricted eating in humans, I would, I actually would say you can find more evidence that it is, has a zero or negative effect than you can find evidence that has a positive effect in people for time-restricted eating. Intermittent fasting, I think you can find some evidence for sure that when people lose weight, that there can be health benefits associated with intermittent fasting. And most people, if they do true intermittent fasting, will not um, overeat enough on the days that they're eating to make up for the fasting days. Okay. All right. So there's no real like special mechanism happening that could increase biomarkers other than caloric restriction. Yeah. Well, so you can speculate for sure. And I mean, you. so this is where I think the people who misrepresent the data can sort of get away with it because you can come up with biologically plausible mechanisms where intermittent fasting or time-restricted eating could have benefits independent of caloric consumption. And I'm not saying they don't, I'm just saying the data that's out there don't support that convincingly. The mechanisms you might point to with time-restricted eating, there is pretty good evidence in mice that um, time-restricted eating can positively strengthen the normal circadian rhythms, which seem to degrade somewhat with age. Okay, so if it is the and, and so just just for for people who maybe don't um, aren't familiar with this idea, all that we mean by circadian rhythm is the normal twenty four hour patterns that some genes show in the way that they are turned on or turned off. So some genes go up and down and up and down in twenty four hour pattern. That's the circadian rhythm. And it's pretty strong when we're young. And then at least in some animals, that seems to get weaker as we get older. And time-restricted eating, if it's done within the normal circadian pattern, can seem to strengthen that signal. Um, so is that beneficial for longevity? I don't know. Um, it seems to be at least partially important for the longevity benefits of caloric restriction in mice. Um, Maybe it's important in people, but that you can point to that. And then with intermittent fasting, and again, we're talking intermittent fasting fasts of more than 24 hours, people will point to changes like reductions in IGF-1, improved insulin sensitivity, maybe activation of autophagy. It's a little bit unclear how long you have to fast to see significant activation of autophagy. So there are biologically plausible mechanisms that fasting will engage that are associated with longevity in laboratory animals. Again, the question there is, if you were to eat enough on the non-fasted days to make up for what you didn't eat on the fasted days, would that counteract all the benefits you get from engaging those mechanisms? Mm -hmm. Probably is my guess. This is where, again, does it come down to caloric restriction or is it fasting or is it the combination of the both? And I think you can find evidence in the literature that you don't need to fast to get significant benefits from caloric restriction. It wouldn't shock me if you got larger benefits from caloric restriction if there was also a period of fasting. So I know that's complicated, but that that's it's important to be precise in, in what we're talking about because so many people aren't. Okay. So and it's confusing to people. So if you have someone who say they're currently doing time restricted feeding or eating and they want to move on to a more traditional or different way, what sort of advice would you have for that person? Yeah, I mean, my view is diet quality is more important than than when you eat, for sure. Um, and I am 
I, I'm certainly not comfortable recommending time-restricted eating or intermittent fasting and not paying any attention to diet quality. I think some people use intermittent fasting as a little bit of a crutch to maintain body weight so that they think they can eat whatever they want. And I think that's probably actually counterproductive. Um, so what I would say is focus on diet quality first. If you find that eating a quality diet in combination with time-restricted eating or intermittent fasting is a useful tool to maintain healthy body weight, great. That, that, that's better than not maintaining a healthy body weight. Is it better than maintaining a healthy body weight not doing that? I don't know. I'm skeptical, but maybe. Um, but I, I think still quality is better than time-restricted eating or intermittent fasting when you eat. What you eat is more important than when you eat. Um, so that would be sort of my, you know, initial thoughts. And the other thing is that, that I, I, you know, kind of harp on is if you are on a caloric restriction diet and you are actively losing body weight, you really want to make sure that you are counteracting the trend to, um, lose lean mass and bone density by engaging in resistance exercise for sure. And I would suggest probably eating a higher protein diet, certainly while you're losing weight. So that's my own sort of personal view on it. And from my own experience, that has worked pretty well. Yeah. Okay. Uh, Similar advice for people taking GLP-1 agonists. Yeah, absolutely. I think, well, I mean, GLP-1 agonists are really a way to induce caloric restriction. It's it's pretty much that simple. Mm. The people who lose weight on a GLP-1 agonist are eating less. That's why they're losing weight. I think the concern is that what we have seen is many, maybe most people taking the GLP-1 agonists also lose lean mass, probably also lose bone density, although I haven't, maybe it's in the literature, I haven't really seen that quantified as much. And that's because when these drugs at least first started being deployed, you know, at a larger scale, physicians were not giving people the strong recommendation that they needed to engage in resistance training and probably increase their protein consumption. 